Welcome to the Breaking 90 podcast, where we talk about all things sustainable fat loss. We take people on 90-day journeys to creating fat loss forever. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Breaking 90 podcast. I'm here today with my co-host, Kelly Sarlo, and we are two of the coaches of Breaking 90 Fitness. (laughs) (laughs) So kind. (laughs) Thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoy the episode. Kelly, how's it going? Not too bad. You know what? Um, It's springtime here in North Bay, Ontario. And I took my two dogs out for a walk. We walk it every single day back in the bush. And because it's springtime, all these new bushes are exposed. And the dogs dove headfirst into a burr bush. Mm. So my entire afternoon yesterday was uh, bathing, brushing, and ripping burrs out. Just totally went awry. Yeah, your dogs have like the perfect fur to collect burrs also. Very, very sticky. Yeah, I was, I showed Emerson burrs yesterday. I was throwing them at him and he thought it was hilarious how they stick to your clothes. Okay. (laughs) It's like, it's so funny. I remember that as a kid just being the funniest thing. (laughs) Worse, they were matted like up under their chin, in their ears. Oh, Oh, brutal. Brutal. Um, and you can't call it the bush, it's the forest. No, I'm Canadian, it's the bush. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you got for a topic today? So this is kind of a broad topic. It's been a topic of conversation in a lot of the coaching calls that I've heard lately. Just, you know, people are on a nutritional points uh, throughout their week to eat in a caloric deficit for weight loss. Um, And a big thing that comes up is caffeine, where people want their caffeine, but unlike yourself, they want sugar and cream in it, Mm. or like their calorically dense caffeinated drinks. And I wanted to kind of touch on a number of things. Um, One being what other sources of caffeine could they enjoy um, if if it's impossible for them to enjoy it black. Um, And also on top of that, like, how can we, what other contributing factors might help our energy if caffeine isn't the be all end all? Cool, cool, good topic. Uh, You want me to start or you wanna start? I'd like you to start. Okay, so I wanna start by saying that caffeine is not helping your energy. awesome um caffeine is absolutely hindering your energy long term right it's a quick fix it's like it's like we talk about it all the time with nutrition but doing something for 28 days is easy because it's extreme and it restricts you and and it's easy to be disciplined for a short period of time but it's not long-term sustainable caffeine is helping you right now but it's hindering you long term, the more dependent you get on caffeine, the more you rely on caffeine for energy, the less natural energy you're going to produce as a result. So um, I need to start with that disclaimer. (laughs) I love that. This is why I wanted to bring it up. I didn't want to, I didn't want to necessarily present it by saying bust the caffeine myth for us. Um, Because I think, you know, people have a psychological dependency to it. They have an emotional dependency to it. There is a habitual thing that, you know, maybe a ritual that they enjoy. But then we somehow end up layering all these beliefs on top of these experiences. And you're saying, ultimately, it's actually hindering your energetic experience. Yeah. And I mean, you're talking like, you know, I love caffeine. I love coffee and I, I I have no intentions of ever giving it up. I'm not saying you should give it up. Caffeine's healthy for you. Coffee is very healthy for you. Coffee. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good. It's full of antioxidants. Um, there's teas that are very healthy for us that contain caffeine, but we shouldn't be relying on it as our energy source. And so in moderation, there's lots of things that are healthy for us. There's wine, there's chocolate, there's, uh, there's coffee, like these are things that in moderation in a healthy diet can contribute to your overall health. But in excess, they're not going to be in line with your goals. And just because something's healthy, I should also say it doesn't mean that it's good for fat loss also. So like, like, like chocolate and wine and avocados, they're, they're all very healthy in moderation, but they're also high calories. So they're not great for fat loss. So that's, that's another thing that we get twisted, but that's, that's going off track. 
Um, so circling back to the caffeine, I would, I would, I would encourage you to try to get your caffeine under management, even without trying to change the way that you enjoy consuming it. So if you, if you like it with cream and sugar, now we're adding extra calories that, that are probably going to be easier to remove from your diet than, than actual food. Um, rather than trying to change that, try to change how much you have, right? If you have three or four coffees a day, then have two or three coffees a day the same way you enjoy it to start, to start. You might long-term decide that you want to cut back on those extra calories too. But right there, if you have four coffees a day and you cut it back to two, you've cut back 50% of your your, your drink calories, right? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? I love this. I think it's fantastic because I think people get into a very all or nothing mindset about this kind of stuff, especially when they they love coffee or the experience of coffee so much. And you're offering a more accessible solution rather than just saying, like, look, you have to let it go or you have to drink it black. Yep. Yep. I got to mute myself while I open this can. I love it. <laughs> drinking bubbly i love bubbly bubbly and caffeine are my fixes um <laughs> didn't want everybody to have to listen to the but now i might as well have just done it um so when when we look at the effects of caffeine first of all on our sleep quality we we one of the biggest factors in our overall energy is how we prioritize our, our recovery and our sleep if you're not prioritizing your sleep, your energy is going to be affected and it becomes a catch 22 where you try to supplement that energy with caffeine, which is going to mess up your sleep. So caffeine's half-life is about five hours. And that's going to be a little bit different based off the person's size, how much you drink, your tolerance, how, how often you drink caffeine. Um, what that means is that if you have 100 milligrams of caffeine, five hours from now, you've got about 50, 50 milligrams of caffeine still in your system. And so if you drink caffeine before bed, your system is still navigating that caffeine. That doesn't mean it's going to make it harder for you to fall asleep. For a lot of people, it will. If you have a low caffeine tolerance, it will. It'll make it impossible for you to sleep. But for somebody with a high caffeine tolerance, it doesn't mean it'll make it harder for you to sleep, but it does mean your body is still navigating that caffeine. Regardless of your tolerance, your body's still managing that. It's like having a massive meal before bed. It's like um, the, being in front of a screen. It's, it's uh, working super late. Anything that's keeping your mind racing. All of these things, your body has to navigate that, what you've given it. If you, if you, if you give it a bunch of food, it has to digest it. It's, it's from a fat loss standpoint, it's still just calories in, calories out. It doesn't matter as much, but your body is now working overtime trying to digest this big meal you gave it. So even if you've fallen asleep, you're not getting the same depth of sleep, the same quality of sleep because your body's managing that. The same thing's going to happen with caffeine. If we drink caffeine too close to bed, we might fall asleep easily, but we're not getting into the same quality of sleep, the same restful state that we would be without having all that caffeine in our system um makes sense so far love it okay so knowing that caffeine's half-life is about five hours we should be trying to cut off caffeine close to 10 hours before sleep and so for a lot of people that's impossible i'm not telling you you have to but every minute closer to that 10 hour goal you can get from where you are currently should over time have a big impact that doesn't mean that if, if today you try it, you're going to notice the effects on tonight's sleep. But if you do this continuously over time, it should have a big impact. I was just talking to somebody the other day who drinks caffeine till 5 p.m. every single night. And I said, like, how's your sleep quality? Not great. I always feel tired. Go figure. Okay, so I asked them. I said, let's try a little challenge just for fun. What What is... A cut off. If we picked a hard cut off that you're gonna stick to every day for caffeine, what is a time that's a little bit uncomfortable for you? But if you push yourself outside your comfort zone, you think you could hit it. And they're like, okay, I could probably do noon, but it would be really freaking hard. I said, cool. So noon and five are very different. That's five hours extra. Remember, caffeine's half life is five hours. So we're cutting our caffeine total in our blood in half in that five hour period. 
So they said noon's going to be very difficult. So I said, let's start with two. Let's start with 2 p.m. as your goal until you you knock that out of the park. And that's your new bare ass minimum. And it's easy. And then we can revisit noon from there. And she's like, oh, yeah, I could do two easily. But she wasn't. She wasn't doing too easily. Right. Because we get in that all or nothing mindset where it's like, well, if I can't cut it off at noon or 10, then I'm as, it's not going to make a difference. But we know that it is. It's that it's that all or nothing thinking. So now she's set a goal of 2 p.m. every afternoon to cut off her caffeine, which she's like, it's not even going to be hard for me to do that. We'll do it and let's see what the impact is. Um, Go ahead. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I just really like this. And I, I think, too, about. The, you we've talked about this in another episode I can't remember which one it was but the busting the myth of morning people that there are people who just wake up completely alert completely happy and ready for the day and their body feels aligned with their mind and and everything's great and I think for a lot of caffeine drinkers this is kind of running in the back of their mind where they think well I'm not that person therefore I need my caffeine to feel like that person and it's like 99% of us need at least five minutes to actually like switch states of consciousness and actually feel like we're in our body. It doesn't happen the moment our eyes open. It doesn't happen the moment that we even step into the shower, right? Like, so the idea that we need to caffeinate ourselves to feel like ourselves, I think is a misconception too. Um, so the people who want it first thing in the morning or say that they need it, can you evaluate the sleep, the sleep quality that you're talking about here, start contributing to healthier sleep quality, and maybe notice small changes in the morning um, where you're not feeling dead tired, you might be feeling just a bit groggy as you're changing states of consciousness, but understand that that's not actually exhausted, that's not actually fatigued, it's just adjustment. Yeah, I don't think there's that many people who just like jump out of bed excited in the morning in general, right? Even the people who get the most done in the morning, they probably would love to lay in bed. They just don't let themselves. And, and a huge part of that is waking up with a purpose. If you're just waking up to go through the motions, like, yeah, that's going to freaking suck. Yeah. So waking up with some sort of purpose there. Um, now, caffeine i'm not telling people not to drink coffee not to drink caffeine either it does have a lot of benefits like it is it is proven that caffeine before exercise will have a higher output so there are advantages to having caffeine before intense exercise but it's a supplement so any supplement is meant to supplement an already healthy healthy lifestyle it's not meant to correct something that we're doing a really shitty job of taking care of Right. So we don't we don't like when people ask, is there like fat loss supplements? Well, those aren't designed to let you do whatever the hell you want. Even a steroid, which is like if we look at a steroid, if if a slob takes a steroid, they're not going to get amazing results from just taking the steroid. You yeah. still have to go out and work hard and eat well. The steroid is going to supplement your work. And so caffeine is a supplement it's meant to supplement our energy and give us that that performance boost in the right opportunities but if we use it every single day to get that boost you're going to need more and more and more it's going to have less less effect so using one to 200 milligrams of caffeine before a particularly hard workout or competition or or something where you need that extra boost is smart Using it every day to increase your energy level is a losing battle. Mm, cool. I like um, and that doesn't mean you can't have coffee every day. I'm not saying you can't have coffee every day, but having it. So, so typically we see health benefits under about 500 milligrams per day. And which is quite a bit like, like a small cup of coffee probably has around a hundred to 150 milligrams. Um, and a large cup probably has two to 300 milligrams, but anything above and beyond that you're you're not really getting the health benefits anymore and you're you're definitely going to get that dependency you could get the dependency on as little as two cups a day um but if you can keep your intake in that in that under region that one to two cups a day you're you're at least not creating what should be a massive massive energy deficiency because of it it's cool so Originally, when I had kind of introduced the topic, I was thinking, you know, like if people really need their caffeine, really need it, um, and they don't want to drink all of their calories 
through the coffee with sugar and cream, you know, could they look, what other options could they look at? And I wanted to potentially explore, you know, different teas that will offer it to you. Maybe people drink tea black and don't need to put honey in it or sweetener in it or anything like that. Right. So that could put you into the caloric deficit that you are actually wanting or get you a little bit closer to it. But you, you've you taken this in a different direction in the sense that you don't necessarily need to even have the caffeine if you're actually evaluating whether or not you're you're using it as a proper supplement or using it simply as a crutch. Um, yeah, you're going to get withdrawals though. Like if you're, if you're the person that has four cups a day right now and you try to cut it out, you're going to get withdrawals. You're going to get headaches and feel like shit. For sure. But I, but if I think about the people who drink maybe one a day, they just have sure. one in the morning because they've convinced themselves that's a morning routine to get energy. They may now look at that and go, well, I don't necessarily have to replace it. I can focus on sleep quality. I can focus on the nutrition that I'm offering my brain first thing in the morning. There are other options without, um, I guess, really, really sacrificing. And then the flip side is you're saying you can keep it and enjoy and enjoy it the way that you love it and just manage it better. Yeah. Yeah. And I would encourage you guys to try. So if you're trying to reduce your caffeine intake, I would encourage you to try to get to a place where you don't need it first thing in the morning. We should have a natural level of energy. After we get through that groggy wake up state, we should have some decent natural energy right there. Using it a little bit later in your morning is more strategic to get that energy boost when we have that mid morning lull. Um, if you're only going to have like one cup a day. So if you're listening to this and you're like, how the hell am I going to cut back? Or I need a calorie saving. You can get caffeine in a tablet form. You can buy a pill of caffeine. And so once again, this is a supplement, but this is an easy way to cut back your caffeine intake. You're getting zero calories in this pill. You, what I, what I've done in the past, I've been down this road before where I've, I've needed to cut back on caffeine is basically I, I take them as needed caffeine pills until I can spread it out further and further. So just like we talk about increasing your step count by five to 10% each week, you could decrease your caffeine intake by five or 10% per week by supplementing with a pill. So that you're not having a high calorie coffee three times a day right? If you can get to the point where you have one high calorie coffee and one caffeine tablet to reduce to make sure you're not going through withdrawals as your body adjusts, I'm not saying take these caffeine tablets forever either use it to get yourself to a manageable point. Cool. You're this is also tying into one of our guiding principles, which is purpose versus pleasure, right? Or purpose over pleasure. So for some people, they might actually think that their caffeine up until this point or their morning coffee up until this point was serving an actual purpose, right? And when you're saying, you know, it's meant to be a healthy supplement to the energy that you're already creating for yourself in a healthy lifestyle, then we, I'm going to lump myself in with these people might sit back and go, oh, so it's actually for pleasure. I actually like the morning routine of the warm beverage, the creaminess of it, because I put milk or cream in mine. So you start to actually understand if it's a ritual for pleasure or for actual purpose. And if it is purpose, how can I make that more like in a healthier kind of purpose? Yeah. And like for that person, you might choose a decaf coffee there when you don't need the boost. Right. All right? Like if it's just that you love having a coffee at that time of day, but you don't actually need the caffeine, decaf is an option. Most decaf still has a bit of caffeine, but it's like a fraction of what your normal coffee has. Cool. I, I'm just hoping that this topic um, helps people have a different perspective, helps them evaluate what their routines are and, and why or how they are serving them. Um, and even if nothing changes in your lifestyle after this conversation, that's okay. At least you're more aware of what, what it truly is. I want to also include that I think caffeine um, hinders people's water intake a lot because they're like, oh yeah, I just drink coffee in the morning and then I start my water intake in the afternoon. Like it's not, it's, it's not as big of an issue as we once thought it was with dehydration and things like that. But it often is just your drink of choice in the morning because it's a warm beverage. I don't want water, but if you can replace one of those coffees with water, you're now increasing water intake and, and erasing that thought that I can't have water right now because it's coffee time. Right. 
mm-hmm. especially when coffee time like gets dangerously close to wine time for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And and I mean hydration all on its own gives you a completely different kind of stable energy. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Just nothing. just like you said with with nutrition. Like yeah. if we eat well and we we hydrate properly and we prioritize our recovery and rest, our our energy is naturally going to start to increase. Yeah. Cool. This is great. Awesome. Well, I hope people got a lot of takeaways here. At least, like you said, something to think about. Lovely. So I'm going to leave them with a little bit of a tip. And it's a time sensitive tip, but hopefully even if people are re-listening, then that it'll work for them as well. Um, We're heading into summer months soon. And I just wanted people to start thinking about what they wanted out of their summer. Um, Because much like a New Year's party, um, a lot of people have high hopes um, of what they're going to feel, but they don't necessarily go into it knowing exactly what they want out of it. And if we have families of our own or different friend groups, and we're not communicating those expectations with the people that we want to spend that time with um, the end of summer comes around and it's it's nothing what we expected it's nothing that we wanted and so I just wanted people to start thinking about what activities they're looking forward to who they're looking forward to spending time with and can we generate some conversation with those people it's not necessarily always about making set plans and being regimented but having the expectations out on the table so that there can be healthy follow-through um, so that you can capitalize on the very few months that we do enjoy summer here anyway yeah <laughs> awesome awesome oh. well thank, thank you guys for being here and listening we appreciate you um if you have any questions further to this conversation make sure you reach out and ask us uh and wherever you're listening to this rate it comment on it uh leave a review we appreciate all of that mm-hmm.